Hi guys, today we shall have another lesson which is series and mathematical induction. To start with, let's study the given situation. As New Year's resolution, Jenny saves 1 peso on January 1, 2 pesos on January 2, 3 pesos on January 3 and thereafter. At the end of 2021, how much savings will Jenny have? Now to solve the problem, let us illustrate the given information in the problem. Let's have day 1 for January 1, day 2 for January 2, day 3 for January 3, day 4 for January 4, and so on. And we write the amount that Jenny saved for each day. On January 1, Jenny saved 1 peso. On January 2, adding 1 peso, we will have 2 pesos. Then as the days goes on, the savings increases 1 peso per day. So that means on January 3, Jenny will save 3 pesos. And January 4, Jenny will save 4 pesos and so on. Now if we get the total savings for each day, for on the first day, we will have 1 peso. Now, on the second day, Jenny will have a total savings of 3 pesos. How did we get that? That is adding 1 peso and 2 pesos, which is the current saving. So, that will give us 3 pesos. Okay. We do the same thing as the day goes on. So, on January 3, the total savings that Jenny have is already 6 pesos. On January 4, Jenny will have a total savings of 10 pesos and so on. Now, as we list the given amount per day, we are referring to a list of numbers. And in mathematics, we call that sequence. When we list 1 peso, 2 pesos, 3 pesos, 4 pesos, we are referring to sequence. However, when we get the total savings for each day, that is, we add 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5, if you would like to get the total savings on the fifth day, we are now referring to the series. So again, the sequence is a listing of numbers, while a series is the sum of the terms in the sequence. To get the total savings of Jenny at the end of 2021, we have to add 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 and so on until plus 365. Now writing that series is somehow a tedious task to do. In mathematics, we have a shorter way of writing a sum of numbers and this is called the sigma notation. It is also known as the summation notation. Let's take a closer look at sigma notation. We use this, the Greek letter sigma to indicate a sum of outputs of a function. The expression a sub i indicates that the function, the function depending on the index, whereas i as the summation index. Letters such as J and K are also used as summation index. Anyway, there's no restriction about which letter is to be used as summation index. You can even use your, the initial of your name. The number equated to the summation index is called the starting index. In this example, the starting index is 1. However, in a set of data, there may be circumstances where we do not include the first set of numbers. Like if you want only the data on the third day and onwards, then your starting index would be 3. The n above represents the upper limit or the last term in the sequence. We call this n as the final index. If n is replaced by a constant, then we can say that the sequence is finite. 
like if we replaced n with 2 and the starting index is 1, that means we are going to add the first two terms only. Let's have a clearer view of the sigma notation. Let's say we have the summation of a sub i where i starts from 3 up to 6. If we are considering the table of values that we have a while ago, this means that we are going to add only the terms from the third, okay, from the third up to the sixth entry. So that would be 3, 4, 5, and 6. Adding it, it will give you a total of 18. There are some basic properties which we need to know in order to make our computation easier. The first one deals about the sum of constants. It says that if we would like to get the summation of k, where i starts from 1 up to n, we can just multiply n by k. That is, if k is a real number. For example, we have the summation of 4, where i starts from 1 up to 5. Writing this in expanded form, we shall have 4 plus 4 plus 4 plus 4 plus 4. Adding that, that will give us 20. But applying the first property of sigma notation, we can just multiply 4 by 5, giving us also a sum of 20. The second property of sigma notation is sum of products of a constant and a term. It says that if we have the summation of k times a sub i where i starts from 1 up to n, we can have k times the summation of a sub i where i starts from 1 up to n. Again, we are considering that k is a real number. Now let's consider the given table of the given data a while ago. And we are asked to find the summation of t times a sub i where i starts from 2 up to 4. That means we are going to consider the second data or the second entry in the set of data up to the fourth entry. So that is 2, 3, and 4. Writing it in expanded form, we, will sh we shall have 3 times 2 plus 3 times 3 plus 3 times 4. Simplifying that, we will have 6 plus 9 plus 12. That will give you 27. However, applying the property, we will have 3 times the sum of 2 and 3 and 4. 2 plus 3 plus 4, simplifying that, will give you 9. Times 3 will give you 27, which is the same as what we have found in the previous computation. The third property of sigma notation is the sum of a sum. That is given by... The summation of a sub i plus b sub i, where i starts from 1 up to n, can be computed like this. The summation of a sub i, where i starts from 1 up to n, plus the summation of b sub i, where i starts from 1 up to n. Now, considering the given data below. We have the um, we have Jenny savings. On the first day we have one, second day two, on third day three, and so on. Then we have John savings, which is one, three, six, ten, fifteen, twenty-one, and so on. Now what if we were asked to get the summation of a sub i plus b sub i where i starts from five up to eight? Following the given property, we will have the summation of a sub i 
where i starts from 5 up to 8, plus the summation of b sub i, where i starts from 5 up to 8. Now, getting the first set of data for a sub i, since the summation index is i and the starting index is 5, then we will consider the fifth entry on the first set of data. And the last entry would be the eighth data, which is also 8. So for the first set of sum, we will have 5 plus 6 plus 7 plus 8, that would be 26. Now for the summation of b sub i, where i starts from 5 up to 8, we are going to consider the entries under adjunct savings, we consider the fifth entry, which is 15. Up to the eighth entry, we shall have 36. So writing the terms, we will have 15 plus 21 plus 28 plus 36. Adding these four numbers, then we will have 100. And that will give us a total of 126. The fourth property of sigma notation is the sum of differences. So just like we ha what we had in the previous, um, previous property, we also apply the same strategy for the sum of differences. So in symbols, if we will have the summation of a sub i minus b sub i, where i starts from 1 up to n, we can get the sum by getting first the sum of a sub i, where i starts from 1 up to n, minus the summation of b sub i, where i starts from 1 up to n. Now let's consider the same data that we have a while ago. For example, we are given the summation of a sub i minus b sub i, where i starts from 1 up to 3. Applying the property on the sum of difference, we would have the summation of a sub i, where i starts from 1 up to 3, minus the summation of b sub i, where i starts from 1 up to 3. Now, that means we are going to consider the first three terms in the given sets of data. So under Jenny savings, we will have 1 plus 2 plus 3. For John savings, we will have 1 plus 3 plus 6. Simplifying these expressions, we will have 6 minus 10. Furthermore, we, simply, for, we simplify that, we will have negative 4. So that means John savings is 4 pesos greater than Jenny's savings on the third day. Now let's proceed to the fifth property of sigma notation where we have the sum of a continuation. In symbols, we will have the summation of a sub i where i starts from 1 up to m plus the summation of a sub i where i starts from m plus 1 up to n. That can be simplified as the summation of a sub i, where i starts from 1 up to n. That is if m is less than n. So for example, we have John savings, 1, 3, 6, 10, and so on. Now let's say we have the summation of a sub i where i starts from 1 up to 2 plus the summation of a sub i where i starts from 3 up to 5. As you can see, it is like getting the sum of a sub i where i starts from 1 up to 5. 
if we're going to write the expanded form of these two expressions, you will have a sub i, that means where i starts from 1, that means we're going to have the first entry up to the second entry. So we will have 1 plus 3. Now, for the second set of sum, we will have from the third entry, so that is 6, up to the fifth entry, which is 15. So we will have 6 plus 10 plus 15. Is it the same if we will just write 1 plus 3 plus 6 plus 10 plus 15? Definitely, we will have the same sum. So just remove the grouping symbols between the two sets. They will just have the same answer. So you will have 1 plus 3 plus 6 plus 10 plus 15. Okay. Adding that, we shall have 10 plus 15, 25, plus 6, 31, plus 3, 34, plus 1, 35. Okay. It's just the same as if you have added first 1 and 3, then add it, add it to the sum of 6, 10, and 15. The last property of sigma notation is the telescoping sum. So, in symbols, we will have the summation of a sub i minus a sub i minus 1, where i starts from 1 up to n. We can get the sum by just getting the difference of a sub n and a sub 0. Now let's have an example to have a clear. Now let's say we are given the summation of a sub i minus summation of a sub i minus 1 where i starts from 2 up to 7. Following the formula which we had a while ago for the telescoping sum, that means we have a sub 7 minus a sub 1. Okay, that is, we have the starting index as 2. 2 minus 1 will give you 1. And your n is 7, so we have a sub 7 minus a sub 1. So, by substituting, the seventh term would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So we have 28. And the first term is 1. Therefore, the sum is 27. We are done discussing about the properties of sigma notation. Now let's go back to the problem we have a while ago. We were asked to find the total savings that Jenny will have at the end of 2021. And we can get the answer by adding 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus and so on and so forth until plus 365. Now, if we write thoroughly this series and adding it one by one or adding the add-ins one by one, it will take some time in order to get the sum. Now, to write it in a shorter form, we shall use the summation notation. But before that, let's recall how to write the nth term of an arithmetic sequence, since we have an arithmetic sequence. Now, it is given t sub n is given by t sub 1 plus 
the quantity m minus 1 times d. In our sequence, the first term is 1 and the common difference is also 1. Now, following the format, we will have the summation of 1 plus the quantity i minus 1 times 1, where i starts from 1 until 365. We replace, in the formula, we replace i, we replace n by i, okay? Then our starting index would be 1, and our final index is 365 since there are 365 days in the year 2021. Now to get the sum of this series, let's recall also the formula for finding the sum of nth term, which is n over 2 times the quantity t sub 1 plus t sub n. We shall use this formula since we know the first term and the last term in the given sequence. Now following the format, we will have 365 over 2 times the quantity 1 plus 365. Now let's perform some operations. So 1 plus 365, that would be 366. Now we can uh, divide 2 and 366 by their GCF. So that is 2. 2 divided by 2, we have 1. Now, to divide 366 by 2, let's have this. 3 divided by 3, that is 1. Remainder 1, case 1 beside 6, so we will have 16. 16 divided by 2, that would be 8. There's no remainder, so we get the next digit. 6 divided by 2, that is 3. So in other words, 366 divided by 2 is 183. Now we multiply the numerator, so 365 times 183, that will give you a total of 66,795. So therefore, Jenny will save 66,795 pesos at the end of 2021. Now let's find a formula that will help us get the sum of um, the same type of problem. So let's say we're given 400 days, not just 365. How can we have a, a much shorter way of getting the sum? Now, what if we have 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus and so on? until plus n and let's suggest that we have this formula n over 2 times 1 plus n that is by just getting the pattern of this where in 365 is equivalent to n okay and 1 as the first term then n as the last term term. Now, in order to prove that this formula holds true to any situation that is of the same setup with the problem, we have to prove using mathematical explanation or probably an algebraic solution that will show to everyone that these two expressions are equal. Now, in proving formulas such as this, we have to apply or to use the principle of mathematical induction. By definition, mathematical induction is a method of proving that a property defined for integers n is true for all values of n, which are greater than or equal to some initial integer. The principle of mathematical induction states that for each positive integer n, let p sub n be a statement that is dependent on n. Then suppose that the following conditions are satisfied. The statement p sub 1 is true, and if p sub k is true for some positive integer k, 
then p sub k plus 1 is true, then the statement p sub n is true for all positive integers n. With this description, we can clearly see that there are two steps involved in the principle of mathematical induction. The first step is the verification step. The second step is the inductive step. Now let's give a name to this p sub n, p sub k, and p sub k plus 1. For p sub n, we call that the conjecture whereas p sub k as our inductive hypothesis and p sub k plus 1 as the proof of induction. Okay. In the verification step or in the basis step, we have to show that equation is true when n is equal to 1. And in step 2, we have to show that the equation or the conjecture is true when n is equal to k and n is equal to k plus 1. So again, it's like proving that the conjecture is true when the inductive hypothesis and the proof of induction is also true. Now let's prove that our suggestion or yeah, proposal a while ago that if we have 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus and so on and so forth until n is the same as n over 2 times the quantity 1 plus n. So formally, we would like to prove by PMI that 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus and so on until plus n is equal to n over 2 plus the quantity 1 plus n. N. So our conjecture would be P sub n, okay, P sub n is equal to 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus and so on until n is equal to n over 2 times 1 plus n. Then our inductive hypothesis would be 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus and so on up to k equals k over 2 times 1 plus k. This would be our inductive hypothesis. Now for the proof of induction, all we have to do is to include k plus 1. So 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus and so on and so forth up to k plus k plus 1 equals k plus 1 over 2 times 1 plus the quantity k plus 1. So that would be our proof of induction. Now we have the first we have the first step which is the verification step wherein we have to prove that the conjecture is true when n is equal to 1. Okay. So if we have p sub 1, that means we will have um, n is equal to 1. Okay. Take note of our conjecture. p sub n is equal to 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus and so on and so forth plus n equals n over 2 times the quantity 1 plus n. Now, since we have n is equal to 1, okay, the first term would be 1. Now, using the formula, replace n by 1. So, we will have 1 over 2 times 1 plus 1. We need to prove that these two expressions are really equal. 
So simplifying the expression at the right, we will have 1 over 2 times 1 plus 1, that would be 2. We can cancel this out. 2 divided by 2 is 1. 2 divided by 2 is 1. Hence, we will have 1 is equal to 1. Okay, now we have verified that the conjecture is true when n is equal to 1. Now, let's have the inductive step. Here, we replace n by k. So, take note that we will have 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus and so on and so forth up to n. Okay, we will replace this by k. Then here we have, will have k over 2 times 1 plus k. This will be our inductive hypothesis. Now, remember our proof of induction. We have p sub k plus 1. Okay, which is equivalent to 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus and so on and so forth plus k plus the quantity k plus 1. Now here we have k plus 1 all over 2 okay, times 1 plus k plus 1. Now we simplify. Manipulating the left-hand side of the equation, we know that this is our inductive hypothesis, and this is equal to k over 2 times 1 plus k. So, we just have to have k plus 1 here, copy. Okay, on the other side, we also simplify the expression at the right, so we will have k plus 2. Okay, simplifying this, we know that there is a common factor k plus 1 or 1 plus k. Now, since we have k plus 1 on the right side, then we just follow k plus 1. Okay. Dividing the first term by k plus 1, you will have k over 2. Whereas dividing k plus 1 by k plus 1, you will have 1. Okay, then we just copy k plus 1 over 2. Then we have k plus 2. Now simplifying further the expression at the left, we will have, okay, as you noticed, we have a fraction, then a whole number, then the LCD would be 2. So we will have LCD 2. So 2 divided by 2 is 1 times k, that's k plus 2 divided by the denominator here is. 1. So 2 divided by 1 is 2 times 1, you will have 2. Okay, so k plus 1 over 2, then we will have k plus 2. Now, as you can see, we can just extract the denominator here. Instead, we put it under k plus 1 then we will have k plus 2, which is similarly equal or the same as the expression at the right. So therefore, our conjecture, okay, therefore, p sub n is true for all n, For all n element of the set of positive integers. So that's it.
That is the principle of mathematical induction. I hope you were able to get that. See you next time.